Okay, I think uh, we're going to start off the webinar now. Um, I hope there will be a couple more people joining as we go along. Um, so good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today um, and welcome to this uh, joint Western Power Distribution and a Regen webinar. Uh, we're going to be discussing the future of distributed energy in WPD's uh, East Midlands license area today. So um, I'm hoping that's the webinar you're expecting. Um, my name is Poppy Maltby. I'm the Regen Project Director and you can see and we'll meet other members of the team as uh, we go through the presentations. Um, just as a bit of background to what we're covering today, we've been working uh, with WPD since around 2015 on developing so future energy scenarios for their four um, license areas in the UK. Um, the process continues to sort of evolve and improve every year, but at its heart, it's really a, a process to try and translate the national, the UK level um, aspirations on decarbonisation of energy into a set of regional scenarios that uh, are sort of fully cognizant of the local resources, the local geography, and uh, regional politics. And why we're doing that really is to help WPD plan for the future of their distribution network and to understand um, the local network challenges that the, that the decarbonisation pathways, these new technologies like electric vehicles might bring and so they can work towards um, solving those. So our agenda for today um, Basically, uh, well, our aim really is to tell you a bit more about what we're going to be doing and what we're going to project to happen in East Midlands and to get your feedback on some, some key topics. So if you've attended our in-person sort of events before on these scenarios, you'll know that they're usually rather longer than uh, sort of an hour and a half, two hours, but um, the current circumstances have driven us online, uh, which we hope is a good thing actually, because um, more people may be able to join us um, but we have attempted to condense information into a much shorter webinar. So we hope that meets your needs, um, but it'd be good to get your feedback on the content um, uh, and whether it met what you needed um, at the end. So the agenda for today, we're going to be hearing first from WPD, from Ollie Spink, um, Network Strategy Engineer. He's going to be talking to you about what they do with DFES and, um, and how you can access that information. Um, Ben Robertson um, is going to be is the project's sort of lead analyst. He's going to be talking about the projections and getting your feedback on some of the key technologies in the license areas. Uh, Joe Noble is then going to talk to you about new developments, so new commercial and domestic uh, developments. And then we're going to be having Q and A at the end. Uh, we'll also uh, maybe cover some interesting questions as we go through uh, some of the uh, agenda items. And finally, of course, we're going to try and get your feedback, uh, uh, make up for lost lunch and coffee breaks um, by getting lots of interactions through menti.com. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Frankie Mayo, who's the project manager. He's going to be introducing you to Menti uh, and trying to get you uh, to give us some feedback. Hi, everyone. Um, some of you may have used menti.com before. It's um, a website, so I'm going to ask everyone to take out their phones or open up another tab on their browsers and go to menti.com and, and type in the code at the top of your screens. And this is important because it allow you to interact with the polls and the questions and the um, live interactivity throughout. And it's also the way that you can ask questions of Western Power Distribution and of Regen throughout. So if you take out your phone and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and then type in the code there on your screen, 77-94-99. And then um, that will allow you throughout to answer questions and polls and also ask questions of us. And then as Poppy said, we will be picking up a few of those throughout and then getting to a Q&A session at the end. Any questions we, we don't get to, we will be responding to offline. Uh, in our um, summary reports that we will produce um, following these webinars and following the learning that we take away and we'll put it into our models and we'll see how that plays out and we'll then we'll be producing a, a follow-up summary report. So look out for any um, further detail there but otherwise please do ask questions through menti.com because then we, we can um, answer them live as we go along. 
So we should have um, one question. Uh, the number again was 77, 94, 99. So um, good to see some thumbs up coming in there from everyone who's um, got through. So we will have a question to start with to get us used to it and also a um, very interesting result. So were you aware of the WPD distribution feature energy scenarios process before today. And so when we say DFES, we mean distribution feature energy scenarios. It is the uh, Western power distribution level future energy scenarios process that we're talking through today. So have a look at those questions and it's great to see those results coming in live. We'll just wait a couple more seconds for everyone to get through to the website and fill out this question. Interestingly, over half people not aware of the process before. Others who have actually looked at the results, so <laughs> a good mix of people. Okay, I'll have 10 more seconds on, on that question and, and then we'll move on to the next one. We've got quite a few people on the webinar today as well, so we'll take it nice and slow so everyone can have a chance at these early questions. Okay, I'll just move on to the next one then. So this one is, what do you want to get out of today? And this helps us understand and tailor these webinars better to the needs of um, stakeholders and attendees for the webinars. Do you want to understand more about the distribution feature energy scenarios process, the DFES altogether? Do you want to hear from Western Power Distribution about specific things in the network, feed into our modeling, or learn more about the actual on the ground story of energy in the area? That's great to get those results coming in. We'll have another 10 seconds on that one. Well, it's great to see that 36% of you want to hear, or most interested in hearing about Western Power Distribution, about the network, because up next is Ollie Spink from Western Power Distribution to talk about how they use the DFES, that distribution feature energy scenarios, in their working um, seeing the results, got a question there, you, you should be able to see it on your phone or on the slides uh, ahead of you. We will also be sharing the results um, at the end when we send out the slides. Um, so I'm going to introduce Ollie Spink now to talk about the network strategy for net zero future energy scenarios for Western Power Distribution. Very much, Frankie. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen if that is possible um, seems that I'm not able to share my screen currently so if you're able to show the slides frankie that would be perfect so yeah we'll just get on that while waiting for those those slides to come up just to reiterate that all the questions through menti.com will be getting to either throughout the presentation or, or at the end. So please do fill them in. And if you can't see the results, do do message us uh, through Zoom. I believe the slides are up there now, Ollie, so I'll pass back over to you. Perfect, thank you. I'll just uh, give you a quick heads up as to when to change slides, if that's okay. Uh, so yeah, morning everyone. My name is Ollie Spink. I'm a network strategy engineer for Western Power Distribution, uh, largely responsible from our side of kind of project managing the distribution future energy scenarios and liaising with them. So, um, next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, the topics I'm going to cover today, I'm going to briefly introduce what are the distribution, distribution future energy scenarios and why they are necessary, why Western Power has started doing this process, um, and broadly what, what we use the DFES for in Western Power. And uh, throughout the presentation, I'm going to be dropping in a couple of updates for the 2020 edition of DFES and any, any changes that we may have made to our process for some of you that have that are familiar with the DFES and what we've used, what we've done in the past, then hopefully you will see where we've made some changes to hopefully improve things for 2020. 
So I'm going to move on to move now, move on now to what are the distribution future energy scenarios. Thank you. So as a as a broad definition, it's a study that we undertake with the help of Regen to um, to understand and project some of the growth pathways of demand and generation that we expect to be connected to our network in the next 15 to 20 years or so. Uh, this is a process that we started in 2016. So in the past, it's taken us two years to get around all four of our license areas. So roughly six months per license area. So we have, uh, we've effectively gone around every license area twice now, um, with re working with Regen all the way. So effectively today is the, is the launch of our round three distribution future energy scenarios for 2020. And a key point there that we're, gonna, that we're gonna make for round three is that round three will be an annual process. So we've, we've committed to producing all four license areas, DFES studies um, on an annual basis. So every year we'll be refreshing them. And this is partly due to some stakeholder feedback, which I'll go into why it matters shortly, but um, to ensure a bit more standardize it a bit more standardization between each of our license areas to make them more comparable was uh, shown to be uh, something that stakeholders would would be interested in so that's something we've listened to and tried to deliver for this year the 2020 version so as a yeah as a brief summary of what what we're trying to achieve um, as part of our transition to a distribution system operator we need to demonstrate to our customers that we're we understand the needs um, now and in the future and as a distribution system operator we'll be able to accommodate those by designing a network that is economic and efficient and as well as meeting the needs of our customers in delivering a kind of a peak power which to a certain level of security for which the network is to be able able to deliver we also are trying to in this process understand the needs of our customers through a bit more of an for their energy requirements rather than what they would just be doing at a time of peak and as part of this it enables us to model and understand more that if we can use the inherent flexibility of our customers by potentially changing their behavior then this could be used in a way to benefit the network and how it's operated so i will go on to now as to why why do we need to use scenarios what's, what's the point why don't we just have have one view of the future and say this is what we we think is going to happen and and that is the case so historically as a network operator for strategic planning we've used uh, extrapolation of historic trends to project out into the future the growth of um, largely demand on our network on our kind of license area level and this has been perfectly fine when we've had relatively little to no growth on a kind of license area level for the last 10 years or so. Um, but more and more, we've been told that we're, we're facing an uncertain future, in particular us as a network operator. We're, we're told we're at the bottom of a kind of a hockey stick curve of potential growth. And this is due to changes in the in emerging demands that we may see connected to our network, like the electrification of transport and heat. Also, a change in the in the generation mix of our of the UK in general, moving away from larger fossil fuel powered um, large power stations and having that generation mix replaced with a larger number of smaller capacity generation customers, largely connected to the distribution network. A large proportion of those renewable. Um, in addition, the the uh, the connection of battery storage to our network, which has the has the ability to operate in a way that is highly beneficial to the, to the operation of the distribution network. And then also new domestic and industrial commercial demand growth that we may see, expect to see within a license area. And all of those coupled with the, the UK ambitions and targets that we were set last year as reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, mean that in the next 15 to 20 years or so, we expect to see quite a lot of changes to the distribution network. And I think the main point of this is, there is no one single pathway that we think is going to happen. There could be, could be lots of different options as to how that happens. So 
heat is a, is a particularly good example. We could, we could go for an elect electrified route or we could go for a more kind of low carbon gas route and that would have a significant impact on whether, whether you need to reinforce the electricity or the gas networks. So the point of scenario based planning is to really try to capture an envelope of what, what we think could happen in the future. Kind of, a, I suppose you'd call it an, an envelope of credible scenarios. And as a network operator, we hope to be able to demonstrate that we can deliver and operate a network that is uh, coordinated, efficient and economic through all of these scenarios. And as long as the growth of what actually happens falls within those scenarios, then we're happy that we are, we are doing what, we're, what we have to do as a network operator and system operator. So um, yes, just move on, move on now to introduce the frame, scenario framework for 2020. So something that we have done since we started this process was we align our scenario framework. So these are the four credible futures that we could see um, with the national grid future energy scenarios. So this is a, this is the project that is completed on a yearly basis. Uh, by by National Grid, which looks at the UK as a whole. Oh, apologies, I think my video might be slightly. Yeah, there we go. I think I think it's back now. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, the National Grid Future Energy Scenarios is a is a study that um, National Grid system operator undertake on a yearly basis. Uh, and it looks at the UK as a whole and the kind of the requirements that we will need to balance the supply and demand and how they see the pathways out to 2050 to uh, reach our government targets for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we found that it's good to align this, align to this so it gives some consistency to our customers that want to look at the national picture and then look at our regional scenarios and be able to compare what, how and why they're different. Uh, in broadly, a lot of other network operators have since committed to adopting this sort of scenario framework as well. So hopefully that's a, that's a benefit we can demonstrate as an industry that customers who will be looking at our DFES and then potentially a DFES of a, of a nearby network operator will be able to see comparisons between the scenario frameworks and be able to yeah, compare one and, one and another uh, a bit more easily. So I hope that shows that as an, as an industry we're trying to standardize these a bit more to um, remove some confusion for our stakeholders. So briefly, I'm, I know that uh, Ben is going to introduce these in a bit more depth, but uh, the key points for 2020 here is that we've got three scenarios that are compliant with the UK's net zero targets by 2050 for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these are, so just to, just to start, the x-axis we have there is the speed of decarbonization and the y-axis there is the level of societal change. So the first scenario there is steady progression. That says that suggests that we don't reach our UK-wide net zero targets, uh, and there is a, a low a low appetite for society to change how they currently behave and engage with energy. Uh, then there are two middle scenarios which aim to meet these targets by 2050, and they're deli delivered through two broadly different pathways. System transformation would be where the society society is not likely to change how they use energy that much from current uh, position. So if you can imagine that would be delivering heat through a more low carbon gas uh, pathway. So customers will be more like more used to using um, heat, a high grade of heat as they don't really currently do with natural gas. And this would be delivered through a more low carbon gas situation. Whereas the consumer transformation uh, delivers these net zero targets, but through a a higher level of societal change. So this would be customers willing to change how they currently behave in order to reach those targets. So we may see, to see, may see more electrification of some technologies in that scenario. And then finally, leading the way, this is a scenario where we, where we aim to beat or hit the net zero targets before 2050. And this would be a kind of an accelerated pathway where we, where we would aim to beat those, yeah. Um, it's worth noting that this is the first iteration of FES which has net zero compliant targets by 2050 as the, those were only published in the second half of last year. 
um, and also a slightly different matrix. In the past, it would just be a kind of a two by two square, whereas now it looks a bit more like a like a Tetris block. Um, a couple of points on this that are important to note: that the the Fez 2020 framework looks at the UK as a whole um, reaching net zero by 2050, and this does not necessarily correspond to each of our four license areas in turn reaching net zero itself as it looks at the wider picture. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent that when we do these studies, in particular looking at the whole energy system, that we need to include the gas networks and other utilities in this conversation as well. And it's some work that Western Power have been doing more recently in our South Wales license area with Wales and West utilities to look at developing a kind of a whole system DFES together where we can look at these pathways side by side to make sure that we're not saying one thing about reinforcing the electricity network and the gas networks are saying a an opposite position where we may end up with over or under investment in either network. So hopefully that's a quick update of the industry aligned framework that we're using for this year. One quick actually actually before I move on, thank you. The uh, a quick update for 2020 is that previously in our DFES studies we would have aligned to the the previous year's published framework. So if you imagine for this year using our old process, we would be following the FES 2019 scenario framework, which is the one that was published uh, as this FES 2020 scenario framework is not due to be published until July. Uh, and some feedback we found from stakeholders is that it often is a bit confusing that we're almost a year behind with the government policies and etc. So some work that we've done this year as an industry is to try and align so that we're all on the same scenario framework for the same year. So we will be publishing these results in the, the, the late half of 2020, but it will be broadly aligned to the FES 2020 framework. Um, yes, so I think we can move on to the next slide as to why do we not just use the FES as a, as a national standard? Why do we just say that it, that is the national picture and we adopt that and uh, disaggregate that down to our license areas? I think the point I would say to that is that the FES looks at the as the UK need for supply and demand, but it's quite agnostic as to where that demand is actually going to be located, demand or generation growth, um, whether it's connected to the distribution network or transmission network and where particularly in the country it's going to be located. And this slide is hopefully a bit of a, a visual demonstration of that. So this is with a reference to a 2019 baseline in each license area. Um, and we have here the Green is the generation growth. Um, so this is the installed capacity of generation uh, totaled in each license area for the highest growth DFES scenario projections as published in 2019. So this will be using our round two data. So this shows that in comparison to a 2019 baseline in the East Midlands in particular, we could expect to see that double by the time we reach 2030 in our highest growth scenario for generation. Uh, likewise for demand, this looks at the, as the measured kind of peak demand per license area in 2019 and compares that to where we might, may expect to see given the growth of such technologies like EVs, heat pumps and just new houses, factories, etc. And this, is, this sees a, an inc well, almost 200% uh, increase by 2030. And I think this graph is, this map, sorry, is trying to demonstrate that there is no one size fits all solution for each license area because there are there are nuances around the geography, the electricity network topology, and the, um, the kind of the social and the the industry in each of each of these four license areas. And we find that as a network operator, we're best placed to use our local knowledge to um, build these scenarios from kind of a more bottom up perspective as to what what resources there and what our customers are likely to to want and as part of this we can we can deliver regional scenarios that we are we are more confident in than using a national picture that is not necessarily interested in where that demand is going to be located on our network so if i move on to how we actually spatially map this um, in 2016 when we started this process we developed the the concept of a electricity supply area and this is a this is was a, an attempt to translate between the data sets that we have about the electricity 
network topology and then other data sets that can be used to inform growth projections for different technologies such as ones published by uh, Office for National Statistics or Ordnance Survey. So what we've done, if you imagine the um, the electricity network topology as kind of a, almost a pyramid where you have your distribution substations at the, at the end of your road typically um, and there will be a large number of these that feed into an upstream primary substation so as an example a 33 to 11 and then the, a group of primary substations would feed into a bulk supply point which would then be up to 132 kV and a group of bulk supply points would feed into a grid supply point which is where we take a supply from the transmission network so we take a for to create our electricity supply areas we look go to the distribution substation level and we draw a an approximate geographic footprint of the area served by each distribution substation and then using this kind of this network hierarchy we aggregate up to create a, a geographic area that we think is supplied by each of our either primary substations bulk supply points or grid supply points um, and if we move on to the next slide, hopefully this will, this will demonstrate this. So for round two in our uh, DFES process, we, we treated the level of electricity supply areas as those um, served by bulk supply points. And the reason for that is that we were most interested in studying the 132 kV uh, network. So we could aggregate demand up to the, up to the bulk supply point level. Um, a key difference for round three is that we are now going to use this to study the 33 kV network. So we've moved effectively a level down the pyramid to aggregate up our electricity supply areas to a primary substation level. So all of our growth projections for different technologies and scenarios will be aggregated up to effectively the geographic area as fed from a primary substation that we would expect to see this demand connect into. Um, and as you can see, the difference between round two and round three on that slide is that there are a lot more areas for round three. Um, and we have also decided to split this up by the local authority area. So we can give uh, totals per local authority, uh, which we found was a useful thing that our stakeholders wanted. So if we, if, yeah, if we move on to how we actually use this data within Western Power, so the main the key output for, for from our perspective is a, is a very large data set which regen provide us with which contains a, a unique a growth projection i suppose for each unique combination of electricity supply area which i just explained earlier um for round three for all four of our license areas this is increased from about a few hundred or so up to about three thousand so there's quite a lot more data to deal with uh, from us and regen's perspective and then uh, around 50 technology, sub-technology combinations that we're looking at, the four scenarios and then the 20 or so years that we're forecasting for. So each unique combination of those four things we will have a growth projection for that then we can, we can map onto a network model for detailed electrical analysis. Um, new for 2020, in the past we would have, alongside this, published a report similar to the four that you can see on the screen there, um, quite a large report. And for 2020, we have, uh, we've replaced that. So we're gonna publish a methodology document as to how us and Regen do this process. Uh, we're gonna publish a summary per technology for each license area, and then a short DFES in five document, which should be a, a quick summary to save you reading such a, such a large document. And uh, I think we've got a Menti question on that shortly. So yeah, keep your eyes out for that. Um, now I'll move on quickly. How are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, so what is DFES used for in, West, in Western Power? So the, the primary purpose that we started DFES for was to inform our strategic network planning. Um, and this was largely done through our shape and sub-transmission studies, which was kind of a detailed review of our, what we were calling sub-transmission network. So 132 kV and 66 kV, where we have it in a license area. So we would use our DFES scenario projections as a direct input. Uh, apply some electrical behaviors to these as to what we expect each technology to be doing at times of uh, peak demand or peak generation where we'd be interested in the in the network capability at those times and then we'd run a full contingency analysis study and find 
effectively where the pinch points were on the network. And we, we have traditionally summarized these in a report that says, uh, for example, in this, in this scenario, we expect to see um, a network constraint in this particular area, but on, in a maybe slightly lower growth scenario, we would expect to see that delayed for five years or so and maybe not manifest itself until much later. And this gives us a um, almost a good heads up as to where we may expect to see or may, may expect to reinforce the network in the not too distant future if these growth projections are to materialize. Uh, this is yeah, another large report that we publish, but um, we are internally thinking of whether there are better ways to try and display this data. So if you have read the shape and sub-transmission reports and you have any, any good ideas as to how you think that could be better displayed, then please do get in touch with us and any ideas would be greatly appreciated. So moving on to other uses of the of the DFES in WPD. Um, so Rio ED2 business planning. So this is uh, another key output of the DFES is that we we use it to inform our planning for the next price control period. So Rio ED2 runs from 2023 to 2028. Um, and as part of our planning, which is already underway for that uh, price control period, we use the DFES as a key input as to what reinforcement we expect to do in that five year period. So this uses a, something called the Ofgem Common Scenario Framework, which was a, an industry aligned position. So a, a project that all networks, electricity and gas undertook to kind of agree on a common scenario that they would adopt for business planning purposes that Ofgem could use to benchmark one network against each other for comparison purposes of business plan submissions. Um, so this is what we, we use to create, to align our DFES projections to and assign uh, electrical behavior. And then these have made their way into not only the business planning purposes, but also some of our regulatory submissions, such as the long-term development statement and some of our yeah, regulatory submissions that we have to publish as a DNA. And then moving on, as I'm aware that we're fairly short on time, the DFES is also used to inform our flexible power and signposting activities. So this is a kind of a short term, uh, I suppose four or five year out look as to where we may expect to see potential constraints on the network in the not too distant future in the short term pipeline. We publish these on our network flexibility map, which is you can find on our website. And the signposting view, I suppose, looks at all four of the scenarios and says, we may expect to see a constraint here in the future. Um, would there be appetite in the region for customers to interact with us, to change their behavior in a way that could benefit or potentially alleviate this constraint and defer some network reinforcement? So the signposting view is really to say, uh, we may be having this issue in the future, are there, is there an appetite in the region for customers engaging with us to help? And then the flexible power view, I suppose, is more of a single scenario using that best view that I just described, that is where we are actively procuring services to alleviate a potential constraint in an area. And if you look at those two screenshots, I think the one on the right is a, a kind of an indicative daily profile of what we may expect to see customers have to do in each month to, um, to engage with us using this process. And then finally, where the data is used for, and this is part of our uh, ongoing push to improve data transparency, and uh, hopefully this works, I'll try to share my screen. There's a host disabled participant screen sharing, so we can just uh, go down, I have some slides. Luckily I was uh, well prepared. Yeah, if we keep going, there was a there was a uh, a link on that slide there, which will be shared after the presentation to our DFES map. So this is something we started six months six months sorry no six weeks ago uh, to publish all of our DFES data. So basically that large data set that Regen supplies with um, published that on our website, and this is um, a launch page that you can see. So it just contains a quick summary as to what what we uh, what the map is trying to show and if you clicked on the view map and if we move down a slide then you will see a view of all four of our license areas um, there there is a 
on the left hand side a toolbar where you can select some different options so select a license area and then subsequently a scenario technology sub technology and potentially a year that you would like to see um, also you can use a year slider at the top there if we move down to the next slide i think i've populated some of these with a screenshot so for the east midlands here you can see for the community renewable scenario and air conditioning this just visually displays the data as to how many in this case, domestic air conditioning units we expect to see in each of our electricity supply areas by the year, I think that's 20, 2030. Um, and it's it's a good it's a good way to visually explore the data. I would I would encourage you to go and have a go and have a play and see if see if you uh yeah, see if you find the data useful. We also have, if we move down to the next slide, there is a a different view to view by actually first if we you, that's just a view of a different scenario so you can see the colors change to align with the two degrees colorway and then if we keep going there is a a view for this by local authority area so this is effectively where we've cut up our electricity supply areas into the local authority areas so you can see these projections by local authority area and if you clicked on any local authority in particular if we move on to the next slide i think we've got a demonstration of that um, there is a, a summary of the of the growth projection for those um, for the options that you picked in the uh, toolbar on the left hand side, and you can see there the, the different electricity suppliers that play into that area. And the one last thing for me is if you see at the top on that slide, there is an export data button. If you press that, then that will export the data from the options you've selected on the left hand side into a CSV file. So you can use it for your own purposes. Um, and we hope that this is useful to some of our stakeholders. It's something that we were, we've been asked for in the past and we provided it normally on a bilateral basis. But um, I think it's, it's better to view this in this way and it's hopefully useful to stakeholders to be able to view so uh, I think if we move up a couple of slides, Frankie, to uh, just before these screenshots, then we have the final comments as further collaboration. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Hopefully, um, for those of you that haven't heard of the distribution future energy scenarios before, that's given you a quick, quick whistle stop tour as to why Western Power are doing them and, uh, and what we use them for. If you have any questions or comments, then please get in touch with either myself or Western Power at the email below for our network strategy inbox. Um, yes, I think I'm gonna pass over now back to Frankie, who is gonna summarize these quickly. May I, may I have a couple of questions? Thank you. Thanks, Ali. I think we've got some um, Menti questions uh, that we were going to be posing uh, that Frankie's gonna put up on the screen um, and I think we've had a couple of comments um, during your presentation one of which that I know about which is a good thing um, which is about the joint um, South Wales uh, DFES that we're doing um, with as an innovation project with Western Power Distribution in Wales and West um, I could go into that in great depth but um, I'm not going to because there's not enough time but yes we're going to be trying to get those results out um, in the next couple of weeks, there'll be a webinar. We're just agreeing the final date, but I'm expecting it to be about the 17th of June, where you can see um, some of those results and get, get that feedback. So um, I'm going to hand over to Frankie, I think, to talk about the, uh, the slides now. Yep, so in, in front of you on uh, mendy.com, you'll see a slide. This is um, a question that was generated from a bit of separate stakeholder feedback we got and sort of ironically talking about um, stakeholder consultation fatigue. So this is just uh, an opportunity for us to get some insight into how well engaged you feel from Western Power Distribution and whether you feel over engaged, which was a bit of um, uh, feedback that we, we're definitely keen to avoid, but we're also aware that other stakeholders may feel under engaged or, or generally well engaged uh, throughout this process and others. So take an opportunity to, to look at your phones or the menti.com where you have it open and, and um, feed out that question. And then um, we have a second question just coming up, so we'll have um, another 10 seconds on that.
So the next slide is talking about the um, publications that are result from this DFES study that will be available um, towards the end of 2020. And of those, we want to know which are the, are the most useful to you. We do release um, the, the, the full raw data set of um, regen's analysis prior to Western Power's electrical analysis. And that has historically, as Ollie said, been accompanied by a large report. That has been somewhat revamped to make it easier for stakeholders to read and therefore feed into this now annual process. We'll also be producing specific summaries of each individual technology that we look at, a methodology pack. And as Ollie showed, they recently produced the DFES map from which as is always the best way to do it, you can zoom in and find your um, hometown or where you live or where you work and, and download the specific data for that. So um, between those, we think um, most stakeholder needs are fairly well covered, but we're asking this question um, each time to, to get your input onto what you find most useful. While that slide is open for a, a couple more seconds, I'll just have a quick um, review of some of the questions. So we've been getting a few questions through menti.com. So great to see those and do keep those uh, flowing in throughout the presentation. A couple of questions about releasing a data set similar to the National Grid first data set. So hopefully this and, and Ollie's uh, presentation answer those questions. But yes, a full data set as along with these other deliverables is available at the, at the end of the process, which will be uh, towards the end of, of 2020. There was a question about how the future energy scenarios we're talking about now um, align to the national grid future energy scenarios. So they are uh, the same future energy scenarios. And um, as Oli explained, we are now on annual process and we therefore work with the same future energy scenarios that national grid work on on a year to year basis. So instead of being one year behind, we now work with them to, to publish data alongside those same three net zero scenarios and, and one non scenario. However, we, as you'll hear later, we, we don't just take the scenarios and apply them to the region by you know, dividing it by 10 and just saying that's how many wind farms you'll get. We're well aware that's not applicable and each region is unique and has its own characteristics, its own demographic factors and industry, its own history and baseline. So we therefore use the National Grid Future Energy Scenarios as the intellectual framework of the assumptions so that every network is working to the same set of scenarios, but we want to create individually and locally fed, bottom-up um, fed stakeholder input into these local energy scenarios. So we'll move on. Thanks everyone so much for answering out that question. And I'll introduce Ben Robertson, who will be talking you through our modeling work for the 2020 future energy scenarios. Thank you, uh, Frankie, and thank you, Ollie. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben, I'm an analyst at Regen, and I'll be talking about the analysis we do here in a bit more detail. Um, so during the presentation, I'll be asking you some questions about some of the factors we use in our analysis, uh, so we can get your feedback um, to get a more accurate picture of the future of energy in the East Midlands. Also, just to mention, we will not be presenting any of the results from the modeling uh, as yet, because we have only just started this round of DFES, and the analysis will go on from now until the end of June. So if you, you can always get in touch with us between now and then, if you'd like to feed into the process, um, we'd like to hear from you. Our contact details will be up at the end. And also, as Frankie has mentioned, um, you, can, you can post questions on menti.com and we will answer them at the end of each section. Yes. Um, so first, a bit of background. As Ollie said, National Grid published a document called Future Energy Scenarios Every Year. Uh, which details four scenarios about the future of energy technologies at, the, at a national level up to 2050. And I won't go into too much detail about those um, as it has been covered already, but um, essentially we use these projections as a framework to project down to small specific areas on a WPD's network called electricity supply areas or ESAs. And I'll show you these on the map in a few slides time. Um, the analysis we do is largely informed by factors that are specific to an area. So the information we get from stakeholders such as yourselves helps us uh, build or create these factors. So the projection stages. For each technology, the assessment we do can be split into three stages. 
Uh, the first is establishing a baseline. So that involves using WPD's connection data, um, as well as other sources of data, for example, the feed-in tariff or the renewable obligation certificate, um, to learn more about where technologies have been built in the past, which will help inform where they might uh, go in the future. Uh, the next step there is near-term growth or um, pipeline growth, and that involves looking through current projects in the planning system and using local factors to determine um, where projects might go in the future or, or how much is actually built and in what scenario. And the last step there is uh, long-term growth, and that involves looking at the future of energy growth beyond 2035. So these are the first scenarios again, uh, as Ollie showed earlier. Um, there are four scenarios which we'll be using to inform our analysis, uh, and we use them more as a starting point before applying local level factors to decide whether certain areas will receive higher or lower deployment than the national average. And without going into too much detail, repeating what's already been said, um, another uh, one of the points that was mentioned that I will repeat is that these scenarios can change every year which is another reason why it's important to make this uh, DFES an annual process so that WPD can have the most up-to-date figures to inform their network planning in all their license areas. So this is a map of the ESA boundaries I mentioned earlier in the East Midlands license area outlined by the gray areas there. Um, and as I mentioned, they relate to um, areas on the network which share the same supply point. So we are doing our analysis to this level of granularity. Uh, they are divided into local authorities, and that's because a lot of the factors we use are at a local authority level, for example, local development plans or waste collection data. Now for this round of DFES, we want to put more emphasis on local authority data, not only as a factor in our modeling, but also to report our projections after the study is completed. Um, and that will feed into that interactive map um, that Oli showed you earlier. So this slide shows large scale generators in the East Midlands. So there's a lot going on on this map, but essentially um, it shows where large scale generation is, what technology it is, um, and how close it is to WPD's electricity network shown by the green and orange lines there. So as you can see, there's a lot of medium scale wind and solar farms scattered throughout the license area. Um, and most of the gas and diesel generators are located in the Northwest region, uh, near locations such as Derby and Nottingham with lots of industry and demand. Um, there are also two offshore wind sites you can see to the right there uh, and they're included because they're connected to the distribution network and not the transmission network and that is um, because they were built quite a, lot to, a long time ago in 2008 in fact. So uh, back when they were built then they were a lot smaller and connected to the distribution network. Now the offshore wind farms we see being built today are a lot larger and connect to the transmission network. So um, yeah, for each of these sites, we know exactly where and when they're built. Um, and we use this data to inform where future growth might go. So speaking of future growth, here is a summary of the pipeline, which are sites that um, have not been built yet, but do have a connection agreement. Um, so there's over 1.5 gigawatts of solar uh, with a connection agreement, which is one of the largest pipelines for solar in the UK of all the other license areas. There's also over 90 megawatts of energy from waste and over 160 megawatts of gas-fired power with a connection agreement. Now, fortunately, we don't have time to go through all the technologies we cover in our study. So we've selected a few that are relevant to the East Midlands, and they include ground mounted solar um, and fossil fuel generation uh, so that includes diesel and gas generation as kind of large scale generation technologies and we've also included electric vehicles as an emerging demand technology so first up is ground mounted solar um, and i'll remind you all at this point to have menti.com up as i'll be putting up some questions in this next part about the factors we use and um, hopefully we can get some of your input to amend those factors or better understand them. Um, so, so far there has been approximately 1,100 megawatts of um, solar installed in the license area, so that's over a gigawatt. 
um, and most of the growth coming between 2013 and 2018 when subsidies were high. And as I mentioned before, we are looking more at local authority trends as well. So this graph shows the growth of ground mounted solar by local authority. Now, not all, all local authorities are shown here, just the largest ones with over 30 megawatts installed. But as you can see, there are quite a lot of local authorities in that category with a few going up to over um, 80 megawatts. And this is where they are on a map. Uh, there are around 200 ground mounted solar sites above one megawatt uh, currently connected in the baseline, making the average size quite small, around six megawatt solar farm. Um, and that's because a lot of them are five megawatts in size, which, is, which was the upper limit, coincidentally, of the feed-in tariff. Now, in terms of future sites looking to connect, there are around 60 ground-mounted solar sites in the pipeline, um, totaling almost 1.6 gigawatts, which is more than what's currently in the baseline. Um, and in the UK, there's a total of eight gigawatts of solar in the pipeline. So this license area makes up almost a quarter of that. The sites um, are much larger as well, with an average size of 25 megawatts compared to six megawatts in the baseline. And the final point there is that um, connection agreements were granted fairly recently, so lots since 2018 there. And that shows that activity is picking up, picking up which is um, largely driven by new subsidy-free business models coming to the fold. Um, and this is where those pipeline sites are on a map represented by the pink, pink dots. Um, and as you can see, they're a lot larger on average with very few small or medium scale solar farms looking to connect um, just now. Um, so that brings me on to my first question, which is about um, deployment of ground mounted solar and specifically when might deployment of ground mounted solar pick up again? Um, so we've seen a drop in projects, new projects in recent years for various reasons, construction delays brought about by Brexit or the coronavirus and a slow transition to subsidy free business models. So we ask you, when do you think deployment is going to pick up again for ground mounted solar? I'll give you a few moments to answer this one. Great, um, thank you everyone, that is really helpful. And the next question I have for you is, um, we'd like to move on, is where will subsidy-free business models uh, lead in the medium term? So that's the late 2020s, early 2030s. So we've learned from previous stakeholder engagement events that this new age of subsidy-free business models favors quite large scale solar farms, um, as we've seen in the pipeline. So will this near-term level of growth um, continue on beyond the 2030s? Will the rate increase, decrease? And a few more moments to answer that one. Interesting, most people thinking that um, ground mounted solar, the rate will actually increase beyond this um, large pipeline we're seeing now. Um, something to consider for WPD's network, I'm sure. Um, so we'll move on to the next question, which is, uh, oh, sorry, well, that finishes the section on ground mounted solar. And now we move on to fossil fuel generation. So that's um, electricity generated from gas or diesel power. So a bit of context again, so far there has been 56 megawatts of diesel installed in the license area with most of the growth uh, or the growth stopping since 2013 or was very slow since 2013. Uh, and for gas, there's been over a gigawatt of gas fire powered installed. 
um, 700 megawatts of that connected in 2016. Um, and that was mainly brought about by two facilities. Uh, so Corby Power Station was 400 megawatts. And in the same year, Derwent Power Station, 250 megawatts connected. So this shows that um, gas-fired power, the capacity in the Lysis area can change quite rapidly. Um, and it also shows that growth in recent years has been uh, relatively slow. So looking at the pipeline, there is 160 megawatts of gas-fired power with a connection agreement. Uh, and interestingly, over 40 megawatts of diesel, um, which almost matches what's currently installed in the baseline. Um, which brings me on to the first question for this section is, um, so for our analysis, we want to know whether this pipeline is likely to connect. Um, the National Grid's FES document has diesel plants decommissioning in the late 2020s in all scenarios, but is there potential for any to connect between now and then? And a few more moments to answer that one. Great, thank you everyone. I think we'll move on to um, the next uh, topic, which is still on fossil fuel generation, but um, with a bit of hydrogen as well. So um, we are thinking about the development of hydrogen um, in our analysis, um, more specifically. So the FES includes a high hydrogen scenario at a national level. So that's a system transformation scenario. And we wanna evaluate the impact that this will have on other technologies at a local level. Um, so across the UK, um, hydrogen has the potential to be used in the following ways, um, which we consider in our um, analysis. So there's heat for homes and businesses, transport fuel for um, larger vehicles like vans and lorries, um, and used to replace natural gas in industrial processes and power generation. So this next question I'm going to ask you is specifically looking at um, the use of hydrogen in power generation and its potential to replace natural gas um, in the long term. So the question is, in a high hydrogen scenario, we want to know if there is potential for natural gas and electricity uh, production to re be replaced with hydrogen, assuming that hydrogen is um, made available in the area. So we've modeled the use of hydrogen in industrial clusters in some of our other work um, past 2040. Um, we think there also may be potential for gas generators to convert to hydrogen as well in the future um, if gas networks are able to upgrade to accommodate hydrogen transport. Great, we'll wait 10 more seconds for this one, I think, before moving on to electric vehicles. Great, um, thank you everyone for participating in that section. That concludes the gas and diesel section. And now um, I'm going to talk about electric vehicles. So what did we learn last time? When we um, did this consultation event for the East Midlands about a year ago, we found that on-street charger availability was a major barrier for fleet businesses as well as domestic customers. And we also found that local authorities wanted to include charger rollout um, in their local planning. Um, so it'll be interesting to find out from you in this part um, later on if on-street charger availability is still a major barrier and whether local um, authorities are planning to deploy more in the near term.
So this, this slide shows um, some of the recent policy, policy changes that are going to affect the near-term uptake of electric vehicles. Um, and I won't dwell on each of these for too long, but just to make the point that um, we do include these in our thinking and as factors that feed into our modeling. Um, and there will be a question up later on where you can tell us if there's any kind of new plans or proposals that maybe we should consider or stuff that we might have missed. Um, so I'll flag that to you when it comes up, um, just to make you aware that these are some of the things that are happening in your area and at a national level. So a bit of background, at the end of 2019, there are around 23,500 electric cars registered in the East Midlands, which is under 1% of all vehicles. And in the 2040s, uh, under a national grid net zero scenario, they project that around 100% of vehicles are going to be electric. Um, so this shows that we are very much at the early stages of electric vehicle adoption with explosive levels of growth expected in the next 10 years, according to national grids, uh, net zero frameworks. So uptake factors. Now uptake factors are what we use to determine where in a license area growth is likely to go. So for electric cars, uptake is heavily influenced by domestic or demographic factors such as affluence, household type, uh, and tenure. Um, those are the main ones for cars. Now we also do our analysis, um, well, our analysis also includes other vehicle types such as uh, HGVs, vans, buses, and motorbikes. And for these kind of non-domestic vehicle classes, we use other uptake factors, uh, mainly locations of commercial properties and depots that might that are more likely to adopt electric vehicles. Also, in addition to electric vehicles, we um, project electric vehicle charges because they have their own kind of unique spatial factors and they will also have an impact on WPD's network. So we split um, charges into different categories, including on street, off street, workplace, car parks and others um, to get a more accurate idea or picture of where they might go in the license area uh, and this will inevitably influence the spread of EVs as well or electric vehicles. Um, so taking on-street charges as an example here um, we can see that they are heavily weighted towards urban areas as these are mainly installed by local councils um, but private developers can also install them. Another example of a charger type is um, hotel charges, which has had one of the highest rates of installation compared to the other charger categories. Um, and spatially, as you can see, they look very different to on-street chargers. They are much more spread out. Um, but something else we need to consider for our models is that um, different charger types will have different utilization rates, which means that the impact on WPD's network won't be the same for all charger types. For example, hotel charges will have a much lower usage than domestic or car park charges. So um, hopefully that gave you a flavor of how we do our, go about our modeling and the things we need to consider when projecting, when projecting uh, charges and electric vehicles. Um, and now I'd like to ask you three questions about the near-term growth of electric vehicles and charges. So the first question is, in the near term, where are we likely to see high levels of electric vehicle adoption? So for each of these um, areas, um, you can rank them from one being less EVs to 10 being most EVs. Obviously in the longer term future, growth of electric vehicles will be ubiquitous as beyond 2035 or 2040, um, all uh, car sales will be electric. So here we're concerned with near term growth in the next five years and a few moments to answer this one. Interesting, quite an even split across all the sectors.
So great, there are two more questions on this. I think um, I'll move on to the second question, which is, um, what are the key barriers to uptake likely to be in the near term? So there's, is it lack of awareness of EVs? And again, for each of these, rank these from one being no barrier to 10 being a major barrier. So there's lack of awareness of EVs, low availability of EVs, so that's about the supply of the right type of vehicle, um, high upfront costs of an EV, or lack of charging infrastructure, which um, from our last consultation event we learned was quite a major barrier. Okay, a few more seconds on that one and I'll move on to the, the final question of the electric vehicle section. Um, great, thank you everyone. So the final question is, how will COVID-19 impact the way people transport in the near term and medium term? Um, so will there be more working from home uh, and less commuting in general, more cycling to work? Um, Reduced use of public transport from um, brought about by social distancing. Um, lower le levels of car ownership, so people actually giving up their cars for alternative means of transport. Um, and will it have an effect on the um, electric vehicle uptake from raised awareness of air quality issues? So we're already seeing early evidence to suggest that working from home will have a lasting effect. More people are going to skip meetings for online calls such as this one. So thank you for all for participating in that question. Um, and that leads me on to the last section I want to talk to you about, uh, which is um, local plans and policies and engagement with local authorities. Um, so we are looking at local planning and different strategies that are being developed by um, local councils and other institutions to combat climate change. Um, as part of this study, we scan through local plans and engage with local authorities to find out more about what is being done. Um, so a bit of context, in the last year, over two thirds of UK local authorities have declared a climate emergency, um, as well as a range of other towns and parish councils, as you can see on this map in the East Midlands. Um, and we are coming up, and sorry, each are coming up with their own ways um, to tackle climate change, and we'd like to include that in our modelling. So this question is about. Um, how you feel are the most popular ways um, local authorities and local councils are tackling climate change and trying to achieve net zero. So what changes do you think um, will be most prevalent um, to in a net zero world in the near term? So for this, you can select a maximum of three, three that you think are most popular because obviously we've seen examples of all of these being um, done. So we're trying to get a regional view for the East Midlands. Quite clear to see the three uh, most popular choices there um, around transport, electrifying transport, um, and new home standards. A few 
few more moments on that one and then I'll move on um, to the final question which will be an open question where you'll have an opportunity to um, put forward some um, documents and current work that's happening around these issues or around other issues, policy changes, local plans, things like that. Um, so I'll move on to that now. Thank you everyone for participating in that one. So the, next, the last thing I wanted to ask is, um, are there any specific documents you can point us towards that we should feed into our assumptions? I'll leave this one up for a bit um, longer. Um, the example shown there is the Nottingham Ultra Low Emissions Vehicle Experience, which is about um, providing business support for fleet businesses in and around Nottingham to convert um, fleet vehicles to electric vehicles. Um, any other development plan or document that um, you can think of to do with net zero, just jot them down. Um, and I'll leave this one up for a bit longer. Um, and while you can keep feeding into it, and at the same time, I'll pass over um, to Poppy, um, who will address some of the questions. So thank you all for participating. Um, for my section of the presentation, um, we really value for your feedback. Thanks, Ben. I think as um, I, I actually really love that those dots going flying over. Something. <laughs> I haven't seen that on menti.com before, uh, so I think that's great. Uh, and we're getting some really um, we're getting loads of um, documents and plans coming in there, which is which is fantastic. And um, this is really an area where we'd like to start reflecting a, a lot more um in the in the scenarios and the and the data um these sort of specific initiatives in the local area now we've we've reflected them uh in previous iterations of the scenarios but this is uh, we're looking to develop um sort of clear, key, clear and key factors that we can put into our modeling uh, which is a little bit easier said than done of course because um often these things are a little bit overlapping some areas have really high ambition, but no particular plan to um, to actually do those things. So, um, so it's uh, it's quite a challenge, but it's great that we're getting so many um, different bits of information from you. Um, Frankie, do we want to? Um, are there any questions that we want to address at this stage? Yeah, thanks everyone again for um, filling in the questions on menti.com. There's a, a couple of points of clarification that I'll just um, go through now and then um, a question for um, Ollie there at Western Power about locating who at Western Power Distribution Councils are required to, to consult with and I know that recently the work of the distribution managers at um, Western Power Distribution has been um, expanded so perhaps you'd like to talk about that. Um, a few of the clarifications though just first about the um, that map and the local authority boundaries and the ESA boundaries so the ESAs aren't related to the kind of um, local authority boundaries as such but they are cut by them so we can report the results for the local authorities um, and that takes the local authority districts 2019 um, definition it doesn't go as as low down as as like wards and postcode or anything like that um, however um, if you go to the, the map and on Western Power's website, you should be able to download the data for the uh, most recent local authority district um, iteration. Um, Ollie, perhaps you'd like to talk a bit about the role of the distribution managers um, to shed some light on who at Western Power distribution local authorities should be consulting with. Yes, thank you. Um, so recently we are, uh, through our distribution managers who are, who are the, uh, the manager of each kind of small local area so for example Nottingham or Coventry uh, each has its own office for Western Power where we uh, where we would do all the local functions and the, the manager of that will be called the distribution manager so as part of our uh, DFES stakeholder engagement recently we have been uh, distribution managers have a pack that they can use to present to the local authority in their regions to uh, effectively play back our most recent DFES scenario projections uh, for comment from local authorities and this has only started fairly recently but we expect it to be uh, an activity where we can try and help feed into 
local plans uh, and provide a point of contact for local authorities to engage with uh, us as a distribution network operator. Uh, I think one point that we that we do have to be careful about as an industry is making sure that we don't end up with a a kind of a circular process whereby uh, Western Power helping to shape the local plans then informs strategic investment and it could end up being a, a kind of a non a non competitive situation. So that's something we, we're keen to make sure does not happen. But I suppose through if um, engaging with Western Power to consult on local plans, either contact the network strategy team or myself um, or the local distribution managers would be a good place to provide that really local knowledge. Well, thanks, Ollie. Um, hopefully to the um, couple of questions we got on that, that answers the question and um, there will be contact details for uh, Regen and the Western Power team um, at the end of the slides and, that, and they'll be sent out um, as part of the slide pack. It's really great to see the answers um, flowing in for the question on Mentor.com at the moment. For example, the East Midlands Manufacturing Zone project, like super useful to, to have these um, projects or documents or plans highlighted to us. If you are trying to remember the name of one right now and you can't quite or you think of something um, just as, as the webinar ends, then do get in contact with us and we're keen to, to hear from, from you in relation to this question and all others. Um, there are many other great questions, but um, we're going to um, answer those uh, in the Q&A session, I think, and we'll move on to um, the next presentation, which is from Joe Noble. And he'll be talking you through some of our analysis of the local plans for domestic, uh, commercial and industrial developments. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Frankie. And hello, everyone. My name is Joe and I'm a graduate analyst at Regen. And I'm going to be talking a bit about our new development study. So I'll go through our me methodology and show you some preliminary results and ask you a couple of questions that will help us gather some feedback. So to begin with, I wanted to give you a quick overview of the new developments process. Um, so the main thing is that we assess the growth of new developments and also the spread of new developments. So it's the, it's the geographical spread and how, much, um, how many new homes there are or how many new factories there are, for example. Uh, and we do this by contacting planning, planning policy teams at each local authority in the license area uh, to get a good idea of when and how, how much of these developments there will be. And this is really important so the WPD can ensure sufficient network capacity for demand and generation on the network uh, to inform them of the requirements and also prevent the network from being a barrier to a net zero future. So I also wanted to give you a quick example just to show you the importance of this study and what it can tell WPD. So this is a big development in the East Midlands uh, called Daventry Northeast. Uh, it's for 3,400 new dwellings, two primary schools, a secondary school um, and other local centres and community facilities. And this whole site is uh, 247 hectares. So this is going to introduce a lot of demand on WPD's distribution network um, in the next 20 years um, while it's being built. And obviously once it's built, um, it's likely that new home standards will mean that there will be solar on some of the roofs. Um, some of these houses will have, have heat pumps and also uh, charge points, electric vehicle charge points will be installed. So this is all going to put more strain on the distribution network to um, deliver that energy. Um, and next up, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our process for the new development study um, and how we're getting in touch with local authorities. So over the past couple of years, uh, Regen have been searching for local planning documents um, to create a sort of database um, with every local authority in each license area of their domestic and non-domestic new developments. Uh, but now we have switched our process. So now LA's local authorities add to our record um, and they do this via an online portal. And this was um, in the hope to allow more accurate site capture and make it easier for LA's local authorities to communicate um, their new developments with WPD. So, 
we send out an email to local authorities. They um, update the data on our portal and answer a questionnaire about local energy policy. And then we collect up this data and assign each site to an electricity supply area, which Ollie mentioned earlier, um, is the area around, say, a, a primary substation. Uh, and then once we've assessed the spread or the geographic spread, we then produce growth scenarios um, for each license area. So high, medium and low growth scenarios. And another thing to note is that this is an annual process. So if you are a local authority and you're not able to give us the most up-to-date information, if you don't have it yet, for example, don't worry because we'll be doing this again next year. So we'll be able to capture that then. So now I've told you a bit about our process, I'm going to tell you about the types of data we collect and this is mainly for local authorities to know what we're looking for in this study. So we collect data of over 20 homes for domestic and over 0.1 hectare site area for commercial and industrial. And this information can be, um, well it needs to be, we need the size, so number of dwellings or site area. Uh, and we need the location, so Eastings and Northings or a map. And the next thing is um, category and floor space for non-domestic, which is really important. So for example, you can imagine an extension to the library at Nottingham University is going to have a lot of a smaller impacts on electricity demands to say an extension of the testing facilities at Rolls-Royce in Derby. So it's really important that we know the category of the non-domestic development. And then finally, if you have it, um, trajectory data and build out rates and providing us the source allows us to fill in the gaps in any data, uh, which is really useful. So a little bit more about data sources. Um, local authorities provide us with many different data sources, which is really useful. Um, most local authorities produce local development plans, which are updated with monitoring reports um, most years, which is a really good way of getting up-to-date data and also local authorities produce employment and housing land availability assessments and five-year housing land supply statements and all of these sources allow us to build up our evidence base to get a really complete picture of the new developments in the East Midlands license area. So now I just wanted to show you a bit about how we assign these sites to uh, local distribution networks or electricity supply areas. So here's an example of Nottingham. You can see uh, the black dots are new development sites and the coloured polygons are the electricity supply areas. Um, so you can see most of the new developments, these are domestic new developments, sorry. Most of the developments are clustered around Nottingham city centre uh, with more out into the urban fringes. Um, and we use uh, we overlay the, the sites on the ESAs to sort of collect up sites into ESAs and then we know um, which bit uh, or which sites will contribute to increased demand in each electricity supply area. So now I'm just going to tell you a bit about how we make our growth scenario. So I've told you about how we assess the spread of the demand, but now uh, I'm going to tell you how we assess the growth. So the first step is to um, distribute the remainder of homes of homes for domestic that we haven't captured. So um, I told you we have a 20 homes criteria for the domestic data. Uh, the same process will be done for non-domestic data, but I'm just showing you uh, the process for domestic uh, in order to keep this, this short. So for East Midlands, a threshold of 20 homes means that 4% of total homes are lost. Um, but results in a 37% site reduction. So this means that local authorities don't, it makes it easier for local authorities to communicate data with WPD that they want to share. Um, so they don't have to be, you know, writing out one, every, every home um, in a big database would take them a long time, but it, it makes it more, it more accessible for them to share their data which is why we have a threshold for both domestic and non-domestic. Uh, so once we've worked out how many homes are left, we then look at the historic growth in the region. So this is a graph for East Midlands license area. 
um, from 2001 to 2018. And it shows how uh, domestic new developments really grew um, up until 2008 financial crash. Um, and then they fell again, but they've been on the rise recently up to 2018. And our job is to sort of to continue um, to continue this graph to sort of work out what that will look like in the future. And that is the purpose of creating the growth scenarios. Uh, and the final task with creating growth scenarios is to use our trajectories and offset these to differing amounts based on the scenarios and also how imminent these developments are. So we tend to give more imminent developments, uh, more likelihood of going ahead um, and less delay. And then we also tend to give higher growth scenarios, um, more developments, um, whereas lower growth scenarios have more trajectories delayed to later years. So that now I've told you a little bit about how we make our growth scenarios and how we spread the developments over the license area, I'd like to ask you a question. So this is about um, the impact of COVID-19 on new developments. Uh, and we want to know how you think uh, COVID-19 will affect build rates in the East Midlands license area. So if you could slide your sliders on Menti, that would be really useful. Um, there's three, op three years here, three sliders. So in 2020, if you think there'll be no reduction, keep your slider on the left. If you think there'll be 50% reduction, slide it up to the right um, and do that for 2020, 2021 and 2022. That would be great. I'll give you a couple of minutes to fill that in. Yeah, and obviously the government has allowed construction workers to go back to work um, at the moment. So we're slowly seeing um, we're slowly seeing the construction starting again. But it's whether you think that will bounce back in later years. We certainly think that we'd reflect your opinions on the screen that 2020 will have had a big knock uh, due to Brexit and COVID. But then in the in the later years, it will start to bounce back um, whilst uh, the, the sites are start to get populated with builders again and they start to get built out. So I'm going to move on in a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to show you some preliminary results, for the domestic side. So on the next slide, I've got a heat map of the domestic developments in each local authority um, alongside the largest domestic new developments in the East Midlands license area. So from this, we can see that a lot of the largest developments are clustered around cities. So you've got Milton Keynes, uh, Northampton, Nottingham, Leicester, Coventry and Lincoln. Uh, and we can also see um, higher amounts of total dwellings around these areas um, with less dwellings in the more rural areas such as uh, Derbyshire and the Derbyshire Derby and Derbyshire Dales um, and in Lincolnshire. So I'll just give you um, a moment. When we show this map, we will always have a lot of local authorities interested um, in checking out their local area. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to have a look if you're interested. Um, and a key part of, a key part of this uh, consultation event is to get feedback. So if you think maybe we've missed off a big site or if something looks wrong, um, then please get in touch. Um, I'd also note that there are a few local authorities that we're missing data for. These are the gray ones. Um, so if you are, watching and you are a grey local authority, please get in touch. Um, let us know if you haven't had an email. I'll give you the, um, the email address at the end of this presentation to get in touch. 
So now I just wanted to, uh, just before I finish off, just tell you about some of the outcomes of the study. Um, so essentially why we do it. So um, Ollie's already said that WPD used the data that we create to model the growth of underlying electricity demand across the license area. Uh, but we also use it to plug into um, disruptive demand models um, to guess how many heat pumps, rooftop solar PV or home batteries we might have. Um, in each ESA or in each electricity supply area. And then also we incorporate uh, your feedback from the, uh, well, your local planning policy feedback and also the feedback from the consultation events um, on local energy policy. And through this, we can see maybe which local authorities or which cities have uh, clean air zones and feed that into our modeling. So just a final slide. Um, please get involved if you're a local authority and you haven't already. Uh, the email is smills at regen.co.uk. Um, yeah, uh, we have extended the deadline for the study. So it was the 30th of April. Uh, we pushed it back to the end of May to give you a bit more time uh, in light of the current situation. And I'm now just going to invite you to post some final thoughts and comments on the Mentimeter Q&A uh, and I will pass back to Frankie to do the Q&A. Great, thanks Joe. Got um, a, a question that's come through um, perhaps Ollie let's take this about um, what uh, benchmarks we use or have been developed to forecast uh, demands of new developments uh, based on, on floor area and I know that um, you could talk about this in, in quite some detail, so what are your uh, thoughts on that? Not too much detail, hopefully. Um, yes, so the, the, this, this refers particularly to the non-domestic um, developments, which, we, uh, which are provided in a metre squared of floor area, as per seems to be the most uh, used unit, I suppose, in all of the local development plans. Um, and there is information about this in our shaping sub transmission reports that have been published and the one the non, one for the east midlands round two is due to be published very shortly so uh, keep it, keep an eye out on our website for that but we used uh, an output from a innovation project which we did with university of bath i believe it was about five years ago or so which looks at um modeling demand profiles in the industrial commercial sector which has a a meter squared of floor space to a kind of estimated annual consumption uh, equation for different customer types, um, which is broadly what Regen um, forecast in terms of factory and warehouse or shop or hospital, etc. Um, and then we use that um, aligned with metered customer data from known customers on our network to obtain the kind of seasonal half hourly demand profiles. Uh, it is work that's constantly trying to be updated and we're trying to improve our profiles as we go forward so yeah it is something it's it's not it's not an area of work that has had a, bit, a large amount of research done previously in kind of translating a meter squared of floor area to a seasonal half hourly demand profile because it's obviously very dependent on the use of the building but it uh, yeah that's what we use it's an innovation project to help with. thanks Ollie. Um, we will we'll take a, a couple more questions um, before we finish, but just to reiterate that we will be sending out uh, the slides and uh, the agenda and delegate list to all attendees and thanks so much everyone for attending. Uh, alongside that will also be a, a brief survey and you can give us some feedback and, and tell, you, tell us what you thought went well or not so well um, and that's really helpful for us to make these, sure these webinars actually um, allow you to, to feed into this process and do what, what you want them to do. So uh, a couple more questions, um, one about the growth and uptake of EVs in new developments, which we just talked about, and um, surely we should look at um, EVs in existing homes, and we sure do. Um, the reason we split these two out is because we think they'll have different um, both spatial factors and uptake factors. So we look at the uh, uptake of demand technology such as um, air conditioning, domestic batteries, rooftop solar, heat pumps, electric vehicle charges in new homes, because they have a distinct spatial distribution and because we think they'll have um, subject to you know, different regulations, different policies and different uptake factors. Uh, 
clearly there'll be those in existing homes as well retrofitted to existing properties and we're really keen and we do uh, model those as well so that we split for example electric vehicle chargers to the sort of on street uh, chargers that you see and then um, off street chargers we also look at we look at where homes with off street parking are um, down to a quite granular level in the license area for example and then we do this for for rooftop solar pv for example for um, domestic batteries and then we use the demographic factors that, that ben showed um earlier um so i'll go through a couple more questions that we've had through um one here for you ollie i think is does the modeling make assumptions on infrastructure required to deal with uh, reactive power inertia etc as renewables increase and uh, a second one is does the modeling use all half hourly metered data or does it use peak figures with some diversity uh, factor applied thank you yeah it's probably best to answer both of those in turn um yes so our modeling and this really refers to the the shape and subtransmission analysis that we that we do having got the results of the defer study um looks at a it's kind of a comprehensive analysis of our network looking at uh, any thermal constraints voltage constraints um, due to various contingencies that we take on the network so arranged outages and then arranged outages followed by faults as an example um, as part of this analysis it highlights where we expect to see network constraints so that may be thermal constraints based on seasonal ratings of our equipment or potentially voltage constraints outside of the the bounds that we are that we have to keep the voltage in um, so as a result on the distribution network at least uh, we can highlight where where we may have where we may require infrastructure such as reactive power services in order to keep the voltage within the bounds um, from the distribution network yes but when we're looking at the kind of system inertia that's more the responsibility of the system operator in the uk um, which so i would i would direct you towards kind of their their reports more for looking at system inertia and actually i think in february of this year uh, as part of the system operability framework national grid did publish a, a document on operating a U uk electricity system with decreasing decreasing levels of inertia so i would have a look at that it's quite interesting um which yeah i think that may answer another question that we had through on inertia as well uh, just to pick up on the other points about profiles so uh, also this will be outlined in our shape and transmission reports but we do apply for four different representative study periods so for winter peak demand uh, summer peak demand and then kind of what what is called intermediate warm so kind of the months either side of summer kind of the shoulder season i suppose uh, peak demand case and then also a summer generation case we model 48 half hourly periods for all of our technologies and uh, assumptions on these are detailed in our shape and transmission reports so that it's not just a, a peak value and then diversity applied for different seasons we try to use a mixture of metered data where we have a large enough customer base to be able to determine that profile um, and then potentially other Profiles will be obtained from innovation projects and learnings where we do not have that large customer base to be able to determine a half hourly profile. Um, and then these are these are overlaid into our network model and we run a study for all half hours. And it's quite interesting because when you look at the uptake of certain technologies, you can see your traditional tea time peak between maybe six, half six or seven o'clock uh, shifting depending on how the different customers use their behavior. And one of my colleagues wrote a really good article on our distribution system operability framework about changing load profiles. And yes, we can I'm sure we can post a link to that after this after this webinar. But that will also be interesting to look at as to how different when you consider 48 half hourly periods in a day and how customers slightly change their behavior, it can potentially move where we see our traditional tea time peak. So hopefully that's answered both of those. Well, thanks, Ollie. Uh, we'll just take um, one or so more before before closing up for the, the morning. One here perhaps for you, Joe, about um, at what point in the local plan process do we want to know about development sites, uh, when the plan has been adopted or, or when it's in draft? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. Obviously, when plans have been adopted, their, their contents are more certain, but I think um, 
for our purposes, it's better to have a more updated view uh, for each study. So if you could provide us with the most updated document, whether it be, whether it be draft or adopted, uh, that would be useful. So yeah, in response to that question, uh, draft is better if you have it. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. And, and I think I'll, I'll pass on to Oliver for some uh, concluding remarks from uh, Western Power Distribution. Thank you so much again, everyone, for joining and filling out our polls and questions. Um, and I'll pass back to Oli. Thank you. I think we have a... Yes, we do. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so just like to echo what Frankie said there. Thank you for your, for your attendance and your participation today. Uh, it's been quite useful. It's uh, obviously not, not quite as ideal as having a face-to-face -face event where we can really get to, get to meet people and um, share contact details, share stories. But uh, I think Menti works quite well and I quite like to see the answers coming in as people are engaging with us. Um, this is the third one of the series now that we've done. So we've previously done South Wales and South West. So uh, today was our third out of the four licensed areas of our DFES webinars. Um, and we feel that they've, they've gone quite well so far and Menti has worked really well. So uh, if you do have any comments about how we could improve these events and make them uh, more engaging or less engaging or um, uh, slightly more tailored to your needs, then please do get in contact with us. Um, yes, so DFES publication timelines. We are planning to publish our DFES in the late half of 2020. So after Regen provide it to us, there's a, a period of data validation that needs to take place from our side. And then we will publish the data and put it on the, the DFES map as an update and then all the other uh, publications that I mentioned. Uh, this, is, this will be roughly five to six months after the publication of the future energy scenarios by National Grid, which is due to happen in July of this year. Um, so yeah, do look out for that. And also the most uh, up-to-date version of our shaping sub transmission studies using our round two DFES data for the East Midlands will be published very shortly. Uh, I can't give you an exact date, but um, yeah, check back on our website to see if that is published if you have more in, more interest in the, the profiles and the analysis of how we use the DFES data. Um, yes, and further collaboration, please do get in contact with us or Regen for any, any comments or um, improvements that you think we can make. Uh, our, my team e email inbox is there, so please do contact us. Uh, and Yes, again, thank you for your ongoing participation and we hope to speak to, speak to you all soon. Thank you.